Section 2.5 on physical applications. I consider this to be probably one of the more difficult sections in this particular chapter. Not because the math, the calculus is difficult, but there's just a lot of conceptual developments. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is mass and density. So when I took college physics many, many years ago, the one thing that I remember about it is that uh, density, which will be the letter rho, is defined as mass divided by the unit of volume. So most of us are familiar, let's say we have a ball about that size, and we have another ball, same size, same exact size, except this ball weighs 100 pounds this ball, which is the exact same size, weighs five pounds. Well, how can that be? Well, their density is different, okay? They have the exact same volume. Their volumes are equal to each other, but one is much, much, much denser because the densities are not equal to each other. And so one ball has much more mass per unit of volume than the other one. Well, if density is mass per unit volume, what we're really concerned about is mass. Algebraically, then we know that mass is density times volume. And so that's our starting point here. Mass is density times volume. All right, let's get rid of all that. So we're gonna start off with a simple problem of a line. So we have a, they call it a thin rod. It is so thin that it really has no volume. All right. Well, we know if we want to find the density of this rod from here to here, we know that the density, um, as we just said, I'm sorry, we know that the mass, excuse me, the mass is equal to the density times the volume. And we know that volume is length times width times height. Well, if there is no width and there is no height, then we simply have length because we're saying that it, uh, we assume that thin rod is thin enough to be treated as a one dimensional object, which means it only has length. There's no width, there's no height. So if mass is density times volume, but there's no width and there's no height, then density, mass is density times the length, which for our purposes, because it's along the x-axis, we have density times delta x. All right, so if we wanted to find the density of this thin metal rod or this wire from this point to this point, all we have to do is we know what its density is, we multiply it by its length. That is assuming that the density does not change, that it has a uniform density. And so they talk about a density function, P of X. Okay, so if you have a uniform density that does not change, it means it's constant, such as two. All right, so our density function is constant in this case. But what happens if the density changes constantly? All right, so the mass is going to be some density function times delta x. Well, if the density is constantly changing, what do we do? Well, guess what? As we always do, we're going to break that thin metal rod or that wire up into a bunch of tiny little partitions. What do you know? And so we're going to assume that within each one of these little partitions that the density is constant. So that means we find the density times delta x for each little partition. Well, then what do we do? Well, we have to add up all of the various masses for all of the different little partitions and guess what that gives us? I'm sure you had it figured out already. So our mass is our density times the distance or rho times delta x 
we sum up a whole bunch of those and that gives us the mass. And so that gives us an approximation of the mass. And so then as we let the number of partitions approach infinity, that means we take the limit, we end up with an integral. It's a very simple integral. As I said earlier, the math isn't hard. It's just the conceptual development of some of these ideas. So our first little formula here is mass is the integral from a to b of the density function times dx. So let's do our first example. Consider a thin rod oriented on the x-axis over the interval from pi over 2 to pi. If the density of the rod is given by the density function, p of x is sine of x, what is the mass of the rod? Well, we simply just put it right into our little formula here. We're going from pi over 2 to pi, so we have the bounds of integration. As always, I like to start off, I didn't write it down here, but we always make sure we know what our bounds are. All right? And then we know what rho is, sine of x times dx. And so we integrate, and so the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, and we evaluate that from pi to pi over 2, and we get 1. So it's a simple little formula. It's not a very difficult uh, problem to do. Now, we're going to expand on this a little bit, right? So rather than a thin metal rod, it covers a longitudinal distance, what we're doing is we are looking at a disk, a two-dimensional disk of radius r. Now, it's two-dimensional. We are assuming it has no thickness. So again, volume in this case, which is length times width times height, if it was a rectangle, or if it's a circle, it would be pi r squared h. We're assuming that it has no thickness to it, okay? So it's just pi r squared. So we um, partition the, so the, if, if the disk has a uniform density, it wouldn't be that difficult to do. But the disk does not have a uniform density. So what we do is we partition it. But when we partition the disk, what we're doing is we are partitioning it as a distance from the radius. And that's called the radial density. In other words, the density varies as you move outward from the center. So we create a little disk here and then a bigger one and then a bigger one and a bigger one. And we assume that each one of these little um, basically, they would be washers, will have a uniform density. All right, so we want to find the, the mass of this little washer right here that I'm coloring in, the outer one. Okay, so that's a little bit of a washer. And so how do we do that? Well, using your imagination again, if you were to take that washer and you were to cut it, like right there, and open it up, you're basically going to have a rectangle. We've seen this before. Okay, basically you're going to have a rectangle, All right? And so the width of the rectangle is delta x, and the length of the rectangle, which was the circumference of the circle. Now we assume that the outer and the inner radii are the same. We take basically the average of the radii, and that's what we're doing here sort of, <laughs> taking the average radius. And so let's just uh, assume that we have uh, an average radius. Circumference is equal to 2 pi times r. Well, our radius is going to be expressed in terms of x, so we have 2 pi x, because we're laying this out, let's say, along the x-axis. All right, that's the x-axis. Okay. So 2 pi x. So that means that our uh, volume is 2 pi x times delta x, or, or not our volume, but our, our uh, area. Because remember, we're assuming that it's thin and only has two dimensions. 
All right, so that kind of gives us this formula right here, 2 pi x delta x, 2 pi x times delta x. So that would be the area of that washer, right? So we take the area of the washer and then we multiply it by the density because remember mass is density times the volume. And in this case, the volume does not have any thickness. So instead of volume, we're just talking about area because that's what area is with no uh, thickness to it. Okay, it's two dimensional. So our mass is density times the area. And that gives us this right here. 2 pi x delta x is my area. And then rho is the density. So that is the formula that we have right there. Well, that gives us the mass of this outer washer, that outer ring. All right. Then we find the next ring. and We do the same thing because that has a uniform density. And then the next ring. And so, as always, we've partitioned it into a whole bunch of little washers. We are finding the mass of each individual washer. We are adding them all up so we have a Riemann sum. And then, of course, you guessed it. We take the limit as the number of those partition washers approaches infinity, and we have ourselves an integral. So the integral goes from zero to the radius of the disk times two pi x delta x. So again, the two pi x delta x is the area, the density rho is the density function. All right, so there's our basic formula for the next problem, the mass density of a circular object. Let's say I'm going to use purple today. So again, this problem is relatively straightforward. We're given rho, the density function is the square root of x, and we're given a radius of 4. Okay? So basically, we're looking for the radial density of a disk. So you've got a disk, and we're looking for the dense. Um, we are looking for the mass of that disk. And so the mass is equal to the derivative, I mean, the, anti the integral from 0 to r of 2 pi times x times rho. And so it's pretty straightforward from there. So we substitute square root of x in there. That becomes x to the 3 halves. Again, I like to bring my constants, get rid of them, get them outside of the integral. So we have 2 pi, the integral from 4 to 0, of x to the 3 halves, which becomes 2 fifths x to the 5 halves. Evaluate from 4 to 0 times 2 pi. We get 128 pi over 5. So as I said earlier on, the, the problems, at least some of these, aren't overly difficult, but it's the, the conceptual development of the ideas. Fortunately, to do the homework problems, you don't really need to understand the conceptual development. I just do that so you kind of have some ideas to what's going on here. The important thing is that you understand the formulas and how to use them and what they mean. All right. Moving on to work done by a force. Okay, work done by a force. This is another thing I remember from physics. Work is equal to a force exerted over a distance. So let's say you're pushing on a wall. <laughs> Who knows why you're pushing on the wall? You just decide you're going to push on this wall. And you know what? You are exerting a lot of force on that wall. You are sweating to death pushing on that wall. You are straining every muscle in your body pushing on that wall, but the wall is not moving. How much work have you done? Well, the answer to that is zero. You've done no work because you have not moved that wall. On the other hand, you take the same amount of force and you push your car down the street. Your car stalled in the middle of the street, okay? Just conk right out. And you're right in the middle of a busy intersection. And so you get out 
and you get behind the car and you start pushing it, pushing it out of that intersection because people are honking their horns at you. The car is moving. It moves over a distance. You end up moving it 100 feet. So you've, you've exerted a force over a distance. You have done work. So work is equal to force exerted over a distance. Now, calculating work is easy if the force is constant. If the force is constant, then you simply multiply force times distance. But we know in the calculus world, nothing is constant. Everything is changing because that's what calculus is. It's the, it's the study of change. So our force is changing. So rather than having a constant force, we have a force function, f of x. Now, if it was, if it was a constant force, it could be some, some constant value a. But most likely, it's going to be some function of x. I don't know, like x squared. Okay, there's my force function. So we are now developing a new formula. So we have a force function, and here is just simply a distance, a distance between two x values. Okay, so we have the x-axis, here's zero, and we've exerted a force from here to here. All right, so we pushed our car from here to here. So we've exerted the force. So force being exerted over a distance gives us that formula. And because our force is variable, what we do is we're breaking up that distance into tiny little pieces. All right. So the force exerted from here to here is constantly changing. So we break it up into that tiny little interval there where we had a constant force. In other words, if you're pushing your car down the street, you start pushing it really hard. But as you get tired, you're, you're, the amount of force you're exerting is going to change. So you start exerting less force and less force. And then somebody starts honking their horn at you and you get all excited. And so you start pushing on it harder. So the, the amount of force that you're applying to the car is constantly changing. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit less, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit less. So we partition that distance into a bunch of tiny little distances. We calculate the work being done each one of those little distances by using this formula. And then we add up all of those little partition distances and we have ourselves a rhyme and sum again. And then we say, all right, well, let's let the number of these partitions approach infinity. And we take the limit as n approaches infinity, and we have another formula. We have the integral from a to b of the force times distance, f of x dx. Another very simple little formula. Now, your homework may have a problem where they simply give you a force. So I didn't include one in my notes because I'm not sure if there's one in the homework. I don't remember. But they might say, okay, you have a force function that is x squared. And you are exerting it over a distance, uh, over an interval from 2 to 5. All right. Well, that's kind of straightforward. We're going to have work is the integral from 2 to 5 of x squared dx. And that's pretty much all you need to do. And then you would integrate that and evaluate it. So you get one third x cubed evaluated from 5 to 2. So 5 cubed is uh, so we have 25 thirds minus 8 thirds, which is what? seven. I mean, 125 thirds. 125 thirds minus 8 thirds is 117 thirds. All right. Now, another common problem, which you do have in your homework, is the work done stretching, stretching a string. So, we have in the first diagram here a string at equilibrium. So, you, we're all familiar with strings. If you just don't touch the string, it has a certain length, right? So, we let the length of the natural spring not being stretched or compressed be a uh, aligned at x equals zero. In other words, along the vertical y-axis. Okay, so that would be x equals zero. That is supposed to be as x equals zero. That is called the equilibrium position. Now, if you compress the string, so x is negative because it's going into a negative direction on the x-axis, we've compressed it this distance, x is less than zero. We call that being compressed. 
On the other hand, if we stretch the string, x is greater than zero because we're going in a positive direction on the x-axis, um, we have stretched the string. Well, we're going to be looking at Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law, according to Hooke's Law, the force required to compress or stretch a spring from an equilibrium position is given by f of x equals xk. Now, this is the force. We're looking at force. The force to stretch or compress a string. The value of k, which is the spring constant, depends on the physical characteristics of the spring, which we don't really care about. So we're going to use Hooke's constant to find our force, and then eventually we're going to find the work done to stretch a spring. So we have an extra step here. Before we can use our work integral that we just learned, we have to figure out what the force function is. So to figure out the force function, we start with Hooke's Law. The force is equal to some constant k times x. And so you have to be given enough information that you can find k. And so we have three variables here, essentially. You have force, k, and x. So you have to be given two of those three things so that you can solve it for the third. So you have to be given some type of a force, and we are. So a force of 10 newtons to compress. Okay, so we're compressing the string. So remember, when we are compressing the string, x is going to be, x is going to be less than zero or negative. So we make x uh, is negative. So we have a force of negative 10. We're looking for k. And it says to compress a spring 0.2 meters. Okay, so 0.2 meters. Um, again, because we're doing it to the left, it's going to be negative. All right, so basically solving that, we end up with k is equal to 50. If k is equal to 50, we simply take that 50, we put it back into our formula, and we get the force function is 50x. So anytime you're doing a spring problem, as soon as you read a problem, you see you have a spring problem, you have to look to see what information that you're given so that you can find the force function using Hooke's Law. Well, once we have that, we're all set. No problem, right? We now know what A and B are. Well, we, when we read the problem, now how much work is done to stretch a spring 0.5 meters from the equilibrium position? So here's my equilibrium position. We are stretching it in a positive direction to 0 0.5. So we are moving from here to here along the x-axis. So my bounds of integration are 0 and 0.5. The equilibrium position is 0, stretching it in a positive direction to 0.5 meters. Our function is 50x. We just calculated that with Hooke's Law times dx. So antiderivative is 25x squared evaluated from 0.5 to 5. We end up with 25 fourths or 6.25. So that is exercise three. And that covers a lot of different information. So remember, the actual use of these integration formulas is pretty straightforward. We have three of them that we've taken a look at now. The work function, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. We've taken a look at this one, which is density of a circular object. And then we looked at the first one, which was just our straightforward mass is the integral from A to B of the density dx. So if you want a little bit more in-depth analysis of where these formulas come from, of course, as always, read the textbook. It gives the, a much more detailed analysis of where these formulas are coming from if you are interested in that sort of thing.
But what I am concerned about is that you can look at a problem and determine how to set up the integration problem and what you need to do, what formula, what integration formula you're going to use. All right, that's it for this video. We'll see you in the next one.